Okay, so um, hello everybody. My name's Ronan Saburn. I'm the head of wine for a private members club in London called 67 Palmel. Um, I've been in hospitality and catering for all of my career. Um, initially, I started off um, going to college and wanting to become a hotel manager. Um, so I did a hotel catering course. Um, I really enjoyed the food side of things. So I, for a while, I thought maybe I'd go on to becoming a chef. Um, but then I've ended up going front of house, ended up becoming a restaurant manager, ended up looking after the wine list. And um, really, that's when I found my passion, when I got interested in wine. So um, I uh, yeah, worked as a restaurant manager in a few places, looked after the wine list. And then I'd, I realized that you could actually do that. Uh, you could become a sommelier and that's all you had to do. You didn't have to be the restaurant manager and look after the wine list. You could become a sommelier and just focus on the wines. Um, so I wrote to a guy called Gerard Basset, who's a very famous, um, very famous sommelier in the UK, in Europe. And he got me in touch with a, a two Michelin star restaurant and I went to work there. Really, first sommelier job. Um, I had a lot of restaurant experience, but not wine experience and not sommelier experience. So big wine list, um, a very tough French head sommelier. Um, yeah, and it was, a, it was a difficult time for me. I, it was a... Everyone else was um, either French or Italian, front of house. I was the only English person. This was 20 odd years ago. And for most um, uh, English people just weren't, didn't work as sommeliers. We didn't know about wine and we weren't interested in wine and we didn't, have, we didn't have the knowledge or the experience for it. So I was a bit of an oddity. I was kind of looked at by the other French sommeliers as a bit of a weirdo. Why is this English man wanting to become a sommelier? Um, there were several times when I wanted to quit when I thought I couldn't do it, when uh, I really thought it was a bit above me. Um, and then as I, as I kind of persevered and I stuck with it, I realized that when all the French sommeliers were gathered in a corner chatting away in French, and I assumed that they were talking about great varieties and wines and vintages, um, and they actually found out they were talking about the football. So they weren't really, uh, they weren't as intimidating as I first thought. Um, and I just buried my head in my books. I just studied, I tasted, I worked very hard and then eventually became the assistant head sommelier there. Um, so, um, but I do think that, you know, if I'd have given in at any point there, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. So it was a case of, uh, yeah, just kind of uh, battling on. Um, whereas you felt that you didn't have the, the right ability or, the, or, the, or the, you didn't have the right skills to actually be there. Um, you know, that was really for my boss to decide. And if I wasn't good enough, he would have sacked me, but he didn't. So obviously I was good enough. So he's kind of just building up your own self-confidence and just thinking that, okay, I can do whatever, whatever I need to do. I just have to put in the passion, put in the hours, work hard, and I can get where I want to. So, so I was there for a few years and then I ended up leaving. This was outside of London and I went to work in a place in London. And um, Gordon Ramsay came in one night for dinner uh, with his wife and I had a good chat with Gordon and he was pretty he was pretty surprised to see an English sommelier as well again it wasn't just wasn't really done in those days um, so we stayed in touch and then when his French sommelier left he rang me and said uh, I want you to come work for me and if you know anything about Gordon Ramsay you know that you probably don't say no to him so he said I want you to come work for me so I did um, so I went to his restaurant at the time he wasn't particularly well known he wasn't a famous chef like he is now um, and we ended up getting a third Michelin star. Uh, Gordon ended up going on TV. We ended up opening about uh, 15 restaurants across the world. We opened about 10 in, 10 in London. We opened in New York, in um, New York, in Los Angeles, in, uh, China, in uh, Japan, in Dubai. Um, and uh, so I was involved with, with, um, with him throughout all of that. So I was the head sommelier. I was the executive head sommelier for the whole group with him during that period. So. Um, so that was a massive period of growth. I ended up having about 50 sommeliers working underneath me. We had about a 10 million, 10 million pound turnover in wine and we had about 20 million pounds worth of stock in wine. So that was a pretty, pretty amazing time. Uh, during that time as well, I was studying for my master sommelier exam. There's different levels in the master sommeliers exam. There's the introductory course, the certified course, the advanced course, and then the actual master sommelier itself. So I'd worked my way through all of those different courses. Um, and during my time, Gordon, I was studying for my master sommelier diploma. 
which was difficult because if you're working for Gordon in those days, you worked some long hours. We were working oh, often 16 hours a day, five days a week, um, and then spending my weekends off studying or tasting again. So uh, I look back on those days and I don't, don't really know how I managed it, but I did. Um, it, so studying very, very hard for the Master Sommelier exam and then working very, very long hours. And then in 2005, I passed the Master Sommelier's exam, which, um, which was a great highlight for me. Um, we are starting to, uh, and nowadays I'm the CEO for the Court of Master Sommelier. So again, uh, it was just one of those things that I always ended up teaching for the course. I ended up working uh, very hard. Uh, on teaching students, on encouraging sommeliers, all of that sort of thing. And then after 10 years or so teaching, um, the board of the Court Master Sommeliers uh, offered me the position of CEO. So now I run the Court of Master Sommeliers uh, again, which is, a, which is one of those things that takes a lot of time um, that I probably don't have time for. But, you know, it's something that I feel very passionate about, about teaching people, about um, encouraging sommeliers in general. And as of last year, we started doing our first Court of Master Sommeliers course down in uh, South Africa. Um, we did it with um, Chenin Noir, um, and we did it over at the, uh, the Saxon over, I think is in, is in Johannesburg. So it's great that we can actually bring courses to South Africa. And we also do a scholarship. So if anybody, uh, anyone who wants to apply for a scholarship, they can look on our website and they can apply for a scholarship. And we'll, we'll basically, we'll, we'll waive all the fees um, to do the course if you wanted to come on that course. So we're doing two of those in South Africa now for people um, who, are, who don't, have, don't earn the money that they need to, to pass those courses. So yeah, so um, yeah, 2005, I passed my Master Sommeliers course. Uh, after that, I ended up taking a year away. I went to Thailand and worked for a year as a scuba diving instructor, just as a total break just to do something different, um, um, just to clear my head after eight years working for Gordon and all the sort of craziness of, uh, uh, of working at very, very high level in lots of different restaurants and managing a big team. I just needed to take some time away. So I did that and then I came back to London. I worked in a place called The Greenhouse and then I worked for a hotel group called the Hotel Devan Group. And then eventually run my own uh, consultancy business and then got involved with 67 Palmal about um, five, six years ago before we opened. So <coughs> 67 Palmal is a private members club based in St. James. Uh, it's kind of not very far from Buckingham Palace. So, you know, we have good neighbours, um, but it's right in the centre of, of, of the sort of elite area of London. We have around 3000 members. Um, who pay an annual subscription to come and to be a member in the club. We have a very big wine list. We have about 6,000 wines on the wine list. We have about 800 that we serve by the glass. Um, we keep our markups quite low. That's part of the, the privilege of being a member is that our markups, normally a restaurant markup for wine might be 75%. We keep our markups quite low, either at 20 or 40%. So the idea is that we have people coming in and drinking good wine every day. Um, and not paying huge amounts of money for it. We have a very big team of sommeliers. We have 17 sommeliers in our team. Uh, we have a, a head sommelier, an assistant head sommelier, three junior head sommeliers, and then some senior sommeliers, and then the junior kind of trainee sommeliers. Um, we also have a big seller team. They look after all of the deliveries of wine. They, they, they bring all the wines up to the restaurant. And we also have a big team of bar backs who manage the bars, who um, fill the glasses up, do all the glass polishing, that sort of thing. So really for our sommeliers, they only have to concentrate on one thing and that's looking after the guests. So we're very, very service orientated and we, we encourage them to be on the floor all times and to be looking after the guests. Um, we also encourage them a lot personally for their personal development, for their training. Um, we put them through a lot of the Court Master Sommeliers or WSET courses, and we pay for all of that. Um, and we actively do a lot of in-house training with all the team. So we get them tasting with one another. We get them asking questions with one another, sharing maps, doing all of that sort of stuff. So they're the two things that we really ask our team to do to, um, to better themselves, to develop themselves. The more that we can help them encourage them to better themselves and to learn more about wine and to be more passionate about wine all of that gets delivered to our customers so really the business does benefit from that 
Um, but we ask them to be you know, super passionate about what they do, to study hard, and then also to focus on the customer service and looking after the customers. So the business is, um, the, the premises is three levels, well, four levels. We have a sub-basement where we have all of our cellar, all of our cellar equipment, all of our, our glass washing areas, that sort of thing. Uh, the sommelier's office, that sort of thing. Then we have a basement that has the kitchen and has a big function room that seats about 60 people in it. And then we have the first floor with three different private dining rooms and the main bar, which is just behind me. And then we have an upper level, which is like a club room, a similar kind of bar and sort of lounge setting. And then up on the fourth floor, uh, we have our offices. So it's a big business. We employ about 120 people in total. Uh, we've obviously been through tricky times recently, as, as everyone has. Um, and we've had to uh, close the club. Obviously, we can't have people uh, coming in the club with, without social distancing. So for about five months, we were shot, shut. So we changed our business model really and we moved it all online and we started doing lots and lots of webinars with winemakers. So we kind of have 3000 members and we know lots of people in the wine world. So we decided that we would basically run webinars with the best winemakers in the world, uh, the best chateau owners, domain owners from Burgundy, Bordeaux, from the New World, from Napa Valley. So we decided we would do that all online and we would get our members in touch with these people. So we run webinars very similar to this um, fr from all over the world. So a lot from Australia, a lot from New Zealand, a lot from California, and obviously from Europe. And then we figured out a way that we could bottle wines in miniature kind of small 75 milliliter tasting bottles. And we would do run a webinar and we would send out people that bought them a pack of six different wines. So, um, and we've done about 600 of those webinars so far. So it was really a case of, uh, we closed, we've got 130 staff, we can't afford to pay them all. We didn't want to make people redundant. So really we had to figure out pretty quickly how we could make money other ways. So we moved kind of the, the concept of the club and the wine uh, all online. So it worked really well and we haven't made anybody redundant, which has been great. And now we are open again, uh, obviously with social distancing, obviously kind of limited, limited seating uh, and limited covers but we are back up and running again. And we will continue doing our online webinars and selling our wines as well. So yeah, so it's, um, it's kind of an environment that we, we build, uh, which is all about wine. It's all about the passion for wine and the sommeliers that work in there and our members that come into it uh, are, all kind of, uh, are all kind of on board with that similar kind of passion and love for wine. So yeah. Um, Excellent, Ronan, uh, fantastic. Truly. Yeah. Um, I'm loving that that the that that this whole um, pandemic has forced you into going virtually. But now that you're open, you're still continuing with that virtual progress. Um, yeah. I imagine the the networking that you can put for for the winemakers and for the um, for the for, for the club members is is incredible. Yeah. No. It's been a, It's it's you know at one point we were doing five a day, seven days a week, and now obviously we're out of lockdown. We we've decreased that quite a lot, so we're doing more like maybe one or two a day, and not on weekends. Um, but all of those webinars are recorded, and they're all available to watch in a kind of a back catalogue, a back library uh, on our website. So um, yeah, and and you know winemakers from across the world when we when we started it and we approached them, they were all very keen to do it. And now we don't really have to approach them. People know about it and people approach us and say, can we do one? Which is great. So they've obviously hit such a um, uh, reputation that yeah, now, now they're queuing up to, to, to join and do one, so. Fantastic. Now, I think so, yeah, that's a great way of, of getting there to showcasing their own wine estates as well. Um, but it's also personalities at the end of the day. And Ronan, certainly, uh, you know, your career path has, has given many people a lot of inspiration, and certainly hard work is 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 the is the driving force. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and especially if you're in catering, you know, if you're in the hospitality business, it's all about hard work. It's about working unsociable hours. Uh, it's about working all the time with a smile on your face. It's all about teamwork. It's all about you know working with other people. Um, and yeah, just kind of inspiring those around you and working with inspirational people as well. I'm sure everyone's worked within teams where some people don't pull their weight and it's very frustrating. So I never wanted to be that person. So I always wanted to work harder than everybody else. 
uh, which obviously meant quite a lot of sacrifice and meant long hours and then weekends working, often holidays working, Christmases or New Year and things like that. Um, but I think that if you decide that you're going to be in catering and take that path, then you have to accept that. And that's, that's as simple as it is, really. Mm. And, and, and really thrilled to hear about the scholarships. Um, we, I will definitely point all the wine stewards to your website and, and follow and also be able to look at your folders um, or your files from the, from the winemakers online. It's yeah. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for your time. Uh, it's been Pleasure. absolutely wonderful to, to, to meet you. And, uh, and, and I know that our winners like um, Michelle Swart and uh, Samantha Swart have thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity of working at 67 Pall Mall I'll be it for one or two evenings. Um, and I know Lovejoy, Nishamba from Element House would, would relish the opportunity as well. So hopefully yeah. it can happen for him as well. Absolutely, I mean, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to invite people to, uh, you know, young people to come and to see what we do. And hopefully if they leave inspired or they get some new ideas, then that's, that's fantastic for us. So it's a pleasure to help. Yeah, fantastic. Well, are there any other more, are there any uh, more 67 Pall Malls in the world? Or is it only in St. James? Uh, well, we are working on one in Singapore. So Singapore will be opening hopefully within six months. Um, and then we're looking in Bordeaux. So Bordeaux and then a bit further down the line, uh, San Francisco, probably um, Shanghai or Shenzhen or maybe Hong Kong, somewhere like that. So we'll hopefully, hopefully within about 10 or 15 years, maybe have about 10, 67 palm miles globally. That's the that, idea. That is absolutely fantastic. Well, don't forget about Cape Town. So <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know you guys. I mean, I think you've for the for the wine side of things, you guys have been through you know a tough time with the with the uh, the ban. Um, and I know that a lot of people in the UK are really trying to support South African wine as much as possible at the moment, because we know it's a, a very difficult time for the South African winemakers over there. So, so yeah, um, it's been it's been devastating for them. Uh, so thank you for that huge support. It is definitely very welcome, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, Ronan, um, All right. we, will, we will chat on email otherwise, but thank you so, so much once again. Okay. Pleasure. All right, thank, thank you again. very much, everyone. Thanks, Kenya.